And good evening, everybody. I am Rita Cosby here in for Ashley Banfield, and this is the second hour of Crime and Justice. Tonight in Florida, a young woman is dead, the mother of a seven-year-old boy who was reportedly in the room when his dad beat her to death. Police say that 42-year-old Mark Berkowitz became enraged when he found text messages on his wife's phone from another man after learning that she wanted to divorce him. So the former construction worker grabbed a hammer from his toolbox and attacked his wife as she lay sleeping. Police say their little seven-year-old son woke up and actually witnessed this brutal attack, later telling officers about the boo-boo on his mother's head. But his dad reportedly turned told him to turn over before dragging her out of the room, strangling her to, quote, put her out of her misery and going to tell his own mom what he had done. I went in the room, grabbed my grandson, and I put him in the bathroom, and I told him to stay there. I'm calling 911, and Mark says, oh no, I'm going to prison, I'm gonna call 911. I think uh, he snapped because she just completely was letting him know, I want, don't want nothing to do with you. Unbelievable story. Well, I wanna bring in my panel on this. David Ovalle, he's a reporter for the Miami Herald. Also certified child welfare and law specialist, Ashley Wilcott, and defense attorney, David Bruno. Um, let me start with you, David, because the mother-in-law um, calls up, right, 911. It's the woman who has been killed now, uh, but she actually is the one who places the call to 911? Yeah, well... Yes, the the mother of the defendant calls 911, and what's interesting is uh, during the phone call, he actually takes the, the phone away from her and corrects what she's saying and says, no, I didn't use a knife, I used a hammer, I killed her. Um, so right off the bat, they have some, you know, incriminating evidence right there. Um, so a lot of this played out on 911 calls, and then, of course, once the police gets there, he gives a full confession. But you know what's so wild? He grabs the phone, David Ovalle, from the mother, right, and says, I killed her. He also said some very chilling things as to why he used a hammer and not a knife. Explain that. Right. So uh, Berkowitz tells the homicide detectives that he does not want her screaming. He does not like knives. He knew that if he stabbed her, she would start screaming. So since he worked in construction, he went and got the, the hammer out of his toolbox because he knew it would incapacitate her right away and, and he would be able to carry out this crime without the same level of noise as if he had used a knife. But you know what? He didn't incapacitate her, David Ovalle, and that's what's so chilling. And then when he drags her, the son's awake, he drags her into the other room to, quote, finish it off. Uh, did he actually say to put her out of her mercy, basically? Yes, he, he told the police that he, he dragged her out because she was still making noises. And, you know, the really sad part about it is is that the the, the young boy who's in the room um, tells the police that, that he hears his mother snoring. Um, and that was weird because she doesn't snore. Um, but really, um, what, what we can gather from that is that she wasn't snoring. She was gasping. She was moaning. She was, she was making some sort of noises um, in the last seconds of her life. So... Uh, really, really gruesome details in this murder. Oh, it is so gruesome, David Ovalle. You know, the other thing, too, is that the little boy, uh, from what I understand, of course, they're staying in the same house as his mom. Uh, the little boy is in the little bed, right? Oh, or she's in the little bed, he's in the big bed. They sort of switched that night. But he's staying there, and he's nearby and wakes up, and the dad actually tells the son, turn over as he's killing, you know, his mom? Yes, and I, I can't even imagine um, what kind of trauma this, this boy is going to have to deal with for the rest of his life. Um, and, and yes, they had been living there, it had been, a, according to the, the mother, it had been a toxic environment uh, for some time. And so this was a culmination of, of many months of, of, uh, of turmoil. And, and the sad part is, um, you know, whether whether Anastasia left him or not, um, she was starting a whole new chapter in her life. She had just uh, graduated from medical school nearby, and she was on, on the path to becoming 
uh, a doctor, which, you know, makes it that much sadder because she would have had a really good and rewarding life with her and her son. Oh, it is so heartbreaking to hear. I want to bring in the attorneys. I've got Ashley Wilcott with me. I also have uh, David Bruno. David, you hear this. Uh, you're defending the guy. He's already confessed to the crime, but the details are so despicable. And as we were just hearing from David Ovalle about the boy being told, turn over while I'm killing your mother, then the mother gets dragged out. I, I can't imagine. And this is a potentially death penalty case. It's a capital case there. What do you, how do you defend this guy? He's already admitted to it. Sure, different case than our last story. Uh, there's a cause and manner. We have a confession. It's a provable case for the state. However, there is a defense. What's the defense? Passion provocation. Here, oh, wait here a it minute. is. You're not okay, first go of there. all, first of all, they're going through a divorce, and right before the murder, he he sees some text messages. Now, under passion provocation, there could be an adequate provocation that puts somebody into the heat of passion. Okay? So while I'm not saying that this is going to be a not guilty, that's not what passion provocation is. What it does is it mitigates. It brings it down from a murder or purposeful, certainly a capital case, down to a manslaughter. It's a possible defense that I see. But he this. knew what he was doing. He even said, I purposely used a hammer. He's a construction guy. He thought it through. Right. He looked at the messages, and then he purposely got a hammer because it would be quieter. He didn't like a knife, and then he decided to finish it off. She's sitting there gasping for her last breath, David. Understood. You're, you're telling me that, that this, you're gonna, he just snapped? He didn't just snap. He planned but the, this. But the passion provocation does not mean he wasn't acting intentionally. It is just a mitigation of the actual intentional action so all that could be true he could still be acting under the prop passion provocation defense. Ashley, as you hear this, um, the seven-year-old, <laughs> you put this before a jury, oh my goodness, this right. jury's going to say, oh wait, let's bring up the little seven-year-old son to describe the boo-boo right. on his mother's head, which was obviously a lot more than a boo-boo. Uh, this, this is so damning against him, and he admits to it. Right, premeditated murder. So the mother was asleep. So even if he's enraged by texts, she's asleep. He gets a hammer, he t leaves the child in there, he does this in front of the child, he tells the child to turn over he needs to face crimes as to that victim as well because not only has he lost his mother he's now going to be traumatized by this forever he will never forget that once he realizes what happened he saw his mother murdered by his father so you believe there should be something also related Absolutely. to the son as well child Let's molest uh, you know, child endangerment, abuse, right yeah. right there's a lot of different charges but child endangerment abuse of the child emotional abuse mental abuse lots of different potential charges what Definitely in play. It, it, it absolutely is. All right. So as a defense attorney, you got to see what what the evidence is. Like every other uh, case, w what's the what? What are the text messages? They could be salacious, right? If they are, it makes a better passion provocation defense. It all depends on the text message. You're trying to say, wait a minute. If this, if the messages are salacious, that he had a reason to get more enraged or something like that. Well, please don't go there, David Bruno. The please content don't. is important as to how it would affect the reader. You know. If it's just hi or good night, it's going to be very different about very sexual, descriptive text messages. Does that matter, Ashley? Come on, do you see it for me? Not enough provocation for someone to kill their wife while they're sleeping. Absolutely not. Yeah, is there any excuse? Can you say, okay, well, maybe he was more heated because the message was more sexual, Ashley? And I think the other factor in this is it's a toxic environment, according to the grandmother with whom they lived, right? And so it's a toxic environment. And when you have that toxic mm -hmm. environment, you need to take steps to get out of that instead of saying, oh, yeah, by the way, I didn't like this text, so I chose to to kill her. Right, get yeah, no excuse. Uh, let me go real quick to David Ovalle because uh, David uh, actually hit on the fact about this sort of toxic environment. Uh, the mom, this is his mom who called 911, described it as sort of what a war zone uh, between the two, that there was constant fighting. So this poor child, the seven year old, went through a lot. I went in the room, grabbed my grandson, and I put him in the bathroom and I told him to stay there. I'm calling 911, and Mark says, oh no, I'm going to prison, I'm going to call 911. I think uh, he snapped because she just completely was letting him know, I want, don't want nothing to do with you. David Ovalle, uh, there was a lot of abuse in that house, right? Yes, and another interesting wrinkle that'll be um, curious to see how it plays out uh, throughout the course of the, of the pretrial proceedings is that um, his mother uh, told the media that, that her son had actually been diagnosed recently with bipolar disorder. So 
there could be a mental health component to this case. Um, you know, who knows if that will ever fly. There's clearly premeditation here. There's clearly, um, you know, cold calculated decision making on his part. But it will be interesting to see in the mitigation and if it comes down to a sentencing, um, what kind of effect that might have on a jury that might be deciding on the death penalty. David Bruno, could that have an effect? Very important. I see fact. you're shaking your head there when you heard that. Very important fact that I did not know. That could be a, a psychological defense. That brings in the expert, the forensic psychiatrist, or psychologist, do an evaluation of the defendant, look at any prior history. Certainly, if there's bipolar, there is the possibility of a mental defect that could rise to a level of a defense. Oh, so we should feel sorry for him, Ashley? No, not at all. And let's take it one step further and say, let's look towards the future and preventing this from happening. If people knew that he was bipolar and aware that he was bipolar. He should have been treated. People should have stepped in to say, how can we help him get treatment so that this wouldn't happen? But it's no excuse. It doesn't mean it makes it okay for him to kill her in the middle of the night when she's asleep and the seven-year-old is there and has to be told, turn over so you don't see what I did to you, oh, to her it mother. Is so heartbreaking to hear about with that seven-year-old, as you pointed out, both of you. It was so heartbreaking. Thank you. And everybody straight ahead, a murder for a higher plot.